welcome everyone to our NCAA Social Series, episode number 21. I'm Andy Katz, pleased to be joined by NCAA President, Dr. Mark Emmert. Mark, there is so much going on and I wanna keep this focused to all the COVID-19 related issues with students and student athletes. That's what everyone is dealing with right now on campus, off campus. So let's keep this focus to those main issues right now. And I wanna start with where, when we started this 21 weeks ago, uh, right after the NCAA tournament and spring sports were canceled, at that point in March, where did you hope we would be uh, as member institutions in mid-August? Well, by now, obviously, we hope, first of all, as a society and a country, we'd, we'd see COVID-19 having moved in a much different direction, that cases would be down, hospitalizations down, uh, obviously deaths down, and that we would collectively have our arms wrapped around this. And, and sadly, that's not the case. We, as, uh, as of today or last data I saw, we've got something like 17 states where caseloads coming down, uh, 13 where it's going up. It's very episodic. It's around the country now. And so we're in a really different place. And what that means is for schools, they're having to make decisions right now about what they're going to look like when they open, if they're going to open. And that puts college sports, of course, in a very difficult place. And that's what's led to the postponements in many cases and others trying really hard to move forward. So obviously major news uh, within the past week from the Big Ten and the Pac-12. I'm going to use the word uh, postponement because there's still hope about the spring and we'll get to that momentarily. But the Big Ten, uh, one of the obviously the power five as we call it, deciding no fall sports. And then the Pac-12 took it a little bit of a step further, no sports until January 1st, mirroring kind of the Ivy League. Uh, so let's first deal with what your reaction was to do those two major conferences making those decisions? Yeah, well, we've now got uh, nearly 20 of the 32 Division I conferences that have postponed. I think that's the right, the right word. We can, we can talk about why I think that's right in a minute. Uh, but when you see schools with very high levels of resources who uh, have enough um, uh, capacity in their in their human resources and financial resources and even their medical communities to to apply a whole range of of protective actions around this still reach the conclusion that gee you know we just don't want to go down this road that's a that's a pretty significant thing to see uh, it, it, that's not a critique of those that are still trying I think everybody's looking at basically the same data there's a legitimate reason to say, well, we're looking at it and we think we can move a little bit further downstream. Where that all winds up in a week or two, uh, again, is going to have to be individual schools and conferences working with their local health officials to reach those conclusions. But there's no doubt that having the Pac-12 and the Big Ten say, no, we're going to postpone and pivot into winter and spring is, is a, a huge blow for all of our athletes. Yeah, so the Mountain West, the MAC also making those decisions, uh, the Big yeah. Sky. Um, meanwhile, as we're recording, the SEC, the ACC, the Big 12, Conference USA for the most part in the Sun Belt are, as you said, still going forward. Um, we have had on this program, if I'm not mistaken, every member of the Coronavirus Medical Advisory Panel, uh, and they have all been pretty consistent. We are hearing, and, and you can get you know, two opinions on anything medically uh, from a doctor and have different opinions here, but there is this coronavirus advisory panel. PAC-12 took one piece of information, made their decision. Same with the Big Ten. How much is that information from this medical advisory panel getting out to the entire membership, including those that right now are still trying to go forward? Yeah, well, first of all, our chief medical officer, Brian Hainline, who's been consistently on this, this series, uh, has been working with uh, the medical advisory groups from across those conferences, especially the big five. So they've been all meeting collectively. They've been sharing views, sharing data, sharing the, the most recent uh, research and best practices. And, and I have to say, 
that the, the schools have been doing a, a remarkable job. They've been throwing a ton of resources and science and energy at these problems to make sure they're doing everything possible to protect and support student athletes. And, and you know, that again, the virus is affecting different parts of the community in different ways. Uh, you know, it looks quite different from one part of the country to another. And uh, schools and conferences are going to have to look at the data. The presidents at the end of the day are the decision makers in each of these cases. And, and they're coming to different conclusions, uh, at least for the time being, about how much longer they can be patient and they can see where the trends really go. I mean, how much are member institutions, athletic departments, essentially dealing with the same kind of information and decisions that school systems and states are dealing across the country where there has not been one answer, one unified voice that one state may make one decision and another may make another, then that's essentially what is happening within the membership. Well, that's exactly right. And as you look at what's going on in K-12 education, what's going on with policies around bars and restaurants, you know, it, it differs around the country everybody's looking at similar data. All the medical advice is in general about the same, but, but people are reaching different public policy concerns and making different uh, choices about what they can or, or, or can't do uh, around some of the, the, uh, these issues. There's a, there's a yearning for every, from everybody to have one person have one voice and make one decision. And the one thing we know about that is that one decision would be wrong <laughs> because we need lots of decisions to be made and they've got to be made locally and they've got to be made in conjunction with state and local uh, health officials. Well, I, and I can tell you as a parent, I'm seeing this firsthand, you know, with a daughter going to Northwestern right now, they can go to school. She has yep. friends that in the Northeast where we're actually doing very well COVID related, and those schools are not having students in person. So, you know, clearly it just depends where you are in the country. Different institutions and presidents are going to make their own decisions based on their local health officials. Um, the mental health aspect, and, you know, I don't want to gloss over this, but I want to get your opinion on this because this hit hard for a lot of student athletes that have worked hard for this moment, for this season. Uh, what is the NCAA doing in that regard uh, to try to make sure that there is help out there if needed? you know, for a lot of these student athletes who either lost their season or are going to have to wait to see if it happens potentially in the spring. Yeah, the last thing we want to do is gloss over mental health issues. I, I worry profoundly about this. Uh, sports, as, as you and I know, are at the center of these young men and young women's lives. Uh, and, and we want it to continue to be, frankly. You know, it, if we think about what's going on this fall, rather than thinking about it as a canceled or lost fall, let's instead think of it as a, as a pivot toward winter and spring. And let's use the fall to focus on the physical and mental health, the academic success uh, of our student athletes. We can't, we can't reduce at the school or conference or national level, we can't reduce our commitment to these young men and women just because we, we can't have fall championships in the NCAA this year because there's not enough schools. That's not their fault. Uh, we got to make sure that we can be flexible in our rules so that they can still continue to have contact with their, with their coaches, with their, uh, their athletic department. That's for most of them, their, their psychological as well as physical home. And we got to be supportive of them. Let, let's not think of this as it's done and over, this right off the fall. No, we need to think about how do we use the fall to support them and everything they do. Keep them physically fit, keep them trained, keep them ready to go for whatever's going to be next uh, in the fall, excuse me, in the winter or, or, or in the spring. And, you know, that leads into what we can do in the spring for fall sports. And, and we've got to find ways to provide opportunities for these, for these kids. Yeah, I just want to go back to that point you just raised about the fall, because this was another thing that drove me crazy over the last week, where if we're not going to have games, well, then everyone's going home and they're not as safe at home as they are on campus. Look, <laughs> you know this better than anyone. If there are students on campus, there will be student athletes on campus, whether or not there is competition. And the same protocols have to be met so that virus doesn't spread within that community and the same testing and all that. Uh, one of the big issues, though, in terms of testing, that was out there. And 
And I've talked to many an athletic director throughout the course of these last five months. Uh, and on these panels that we had here, there was an assumption that we would get to a point of much better rapid testing, you know, within 72 hours, within 24 hours, 15 minutes, an hour. Um, what's your hope that by the time we get to December or January, we're going to be a much better position testing wise to be able to have competition uh, for, for sure in the, uh, in the winter and spring semester? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually pretty optimistic given all of the, the brain power and energy and frankly money that's being put on the testing issue in the private sector as well as the public sector that, that we're, we're months away, not, not days or weeks, but some months away from, from having much higher quality antigen testing in terms of its reliability, much greater availability of those tests and at a, at a cheaper price point. And, and if we can get there, then as we move into the winter, we can do much, much more testing. We can do it frequently. We can do it daily, uh, it, you know, in the perfect world. And it's turned around in 15 minutes instead of 15 days. Right now, the PCR exam, as you, as you well know, that test is still the gold standard. But in a lot of the country, that, that's still three, four, five, seven day turnaround. Well, in the life of a college student, that's an eternity. So we, we've got to get better, and I'm, and I'm optimistic we can. We're not there right now, but I think we can get there. So I want to get to the, the spring athletes and the championships here momentarily, but I want to go back to this point uh, of the way the NCAA is structured uh, and why college football at the FBS level, not the FCS level, uh, that you know is the Power Five and, and the Group of Five, is just different. And people – for whatever reason, still don't understand this. I got friends in the media that don't cover college athletics that still don't get it. Explain, <laughs> please, in the, uh, you know, the Cliff Notes version here, why the Indianapolis headquarters of the NCAA does not control major college football in terms of its competition. Yeah, so, so everybody wants to use the analog of, of the NFL or, or anything else. A few quick points. One, this is American higher education. American higher education has never spoken with one voice and never is going to do that. That's maybe unique to America. You can say it's good, bad, or otherwise, but that's just the way it is. Every campus gets to make its own decisions. That's how we operate. Two, the NCA has never had oversight over the bowl games or postseason play in the highest level of football. Uh, even when, when back in the, in the, 80s when there was a single TV contract, that had some level of control over, over bowls and, and, and the like. But, but the postseason play in, in a football evolved organically over literally 100 years. The seasons would end and then there were these bowl games and there never has been an NCAA playoff like we have an FCS football and every other NCAA sports. So, so it only made good sense that FBS postseason play would then be able to evolve on its own basis. So, so uh, the, the college football playoff and the old BCS is nothing more than a series of contractual agreements among those 10 conferences to say, let's talk about how we want to end the year. And they came together with this model and it works remarkably well. I get that, that people want simple answers. I get that it's frustrating that some conferences are playing and some aren't. Uh, you know, right now, that's just the way it, it has to be to do this inside college sports. It's not right or wrong or better or worse. And when people say, well, if we just had a czar that come in and say, we're going to make a decision, that'll be it. You know, people, it, history, if it's taught us anything, people love the concept of a czar. They hate czars. <laughs> All you have to do, by the way, I was a Russian studies major. Oh, there the, you go. The czar era did not end well. Side well. Authoritarianism is a really fun concept. It just sucks when people actually have to live under it. And, and so, sure, it's fun to talk about, but nobody that ever advocates it actually lived inside it. Yeah, so just to be very clear here, you could not tell the SEC, as you, Mark Emmert, or any NCAA president, you can't play college football. That's correct. We have no authority to do that. Uh, and, and, you know, we don't have authority to say to a school, yeah, okay, we know that your conference isn't playing, but if you want to go ahead and play over here, I, I may think that's a silly idea, but it's not up to me. It's not up to anybody. That school has its own authority to do that. Now, its conference colleagues could say, you know, if you do that, we're going to throw you out of the conference. That's fine. But, 
but they still can do what they want there. That's never been the prerogative of the NCAA. And in my opinion, it never should be. All right, good. I want to get that out there. So now let's deal yeah, good. Thank with you. eligibility issues, which the headquarters does have control over. Um, you know, on the student side, there's deferrals, there's gap years. You know, what do you do with those students? Do you let them back in? Do you have a bloated freshman class in the fall of 21? A lot of big decisions for presidents at that level. Now on the athletic side, what are the plans for students who choose to opt out, uh, don't want to play, even if it's in the spring, uh, you know, and want to have that extra year, uh, you know, whether that's a fifth or sixth year, if they choose to do so. And then the other thing, part of this is, you know, transfers. If they say, hey, my school's not playing, but I see over here someone else is, how do you handle that? Yeah, so a, a week or so ago, the Board of Governors, which is the highest level part of the governing body, group of university presidents and five other citizens, that group and I sat down, we worked our way through a bunch of these questions, and they said, look, it's not our job to finish figuring out the details. What we are saying is all of you schools, if you're going to play sports, you must provide students an opportunity to opt out around COVID-19 and you got to honor their scholarship. You can't yank a scholarship because a kid says, I don't want to play because of this. You, you've got to honor that. Secondly, they said to all three divisions, if, if you have to cancel a conference, excuse me, a, a, a season in your conference or anywhere, you got to determine what the eligibility requirements are going to be uh, for that student to recover that season, just as you did in the spring. We did this in the spring and it's working out just fine. Uh, you got to do that before the season begins so the kid knows what his or her opportunities are. The Division I Council, which is, handles this kind of detail work, yesterday just came back and said, look, you can maintain your eligibility as long as you don't participate in 50% of the competitions of a regular season. So that's, that's you know, just, just yesterday's decision. So, so they're all working through this. The point is to try and preserve eligibility, make sure kids don't lose scholarships. Schools are gonna have the problem you just described. They, they, they're going to have more athletes on their roster than they do in any other year. Same thing happened with, with spring sports. Next year's baseball season, there's gonna be a whole lot of eligible baseball players. And that's gonna be complicated and it's gonna be hard, but it's the only fair thing to do to the kids. Let them, if they want to have more season, another season of eligibility, look, higher education figuring out the human genome, we can figure out a roster chart. Uh, that's, not, that's not that complicated. Be fair to the kids. That's, the, that's what the board is saying and that's what I've said. All right, so I want to circle back to our point at the beginning, which is the word postpone, not cancel. Um, obviously, it hasn't been officially by Division I. It was at 2-3, but all these sports essentially are below that 50%, uh, especially volleyball, where the Big Ten and the Pac-12 have dominated that sport. So volleyball, cross country, men's and women's soccer, field hockey, and obviously FCS football. Uh, we hope we have this problem, but if everything has to be shoehorned into the spring, with the spring sports, with the conclusion of the winter sports in March and April, how could that work? Well, first of all, you're, you're, you're right that we cannot now, uh, at this point, have fall NCAA championships because there's not enough schools participating. Uh, the board also established, uh, Board of Governors also said, look, if you don't have half of the schools playing a sport, you can't have a legitimate championship. So we can't in any division one uh, NCAA championship sport now, which is everything other than FBS football that goes on in the fall. So sadly, tragically, that's going to be the case this fall, you know, full stop. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't and can't turn toward winter and spring and say, okay, how can we create a legitimate championship for all those students? My staff's been working hard on it, been talking to a lot of commissioners, all the commissioners, all 32 of them in D1. And, and there are ways to do this. I'm completely confident that we can figure this out. If schools and conferences want to move forward and try and have, and, and more than half of them want to do it, and that's surely the indication right now, then let's do it. We can use the fall, as I said, to keep kids healthy, keep them engaged with their coaches and their athletic departments, focus on their academic success, you know, work with them and, and let them practice and, and you know, stay, stay ready to play. Then let's go compete at that time. 
couple things have to occur, Andy, and, there, and there's one that's really, really important. We have to give highest priority to the winter and spring sports because they lost their championship last March. We made that horrible, awful, but necessary choice to shut down, didn't have Frozen Four, didn't have Final Fours, didn't have World Series and softball and baseball or track cha championships, we, lacrosse. We, we lost all of that. We, we got to say, first and foremost, we're going to protect those spaces. But then when we look at it and say, look, if we, if we modify the model, which we need to do anyway because of the virus, if we modify the model, shrink the bracket sizes, do some, do everything in predetermined sites instead of running kids around the country, use predetermined sites, move toward bubbles or semi-bubble models in volleyball, let's say, or, or soccer. Um, there's, there's a way to do it. Will it be normal? Of course not. It'll be, you'll be playing a fall sport in the spring. Will it create other conflicts and challenges? Of course. But is it doable? Yeah, it, it is doable. And, and we want to do that. We want to, again, make it work for, this, for these students. Uh, will there be competitive issues and competitive balance questions? No doubt. But this is a very unusual year. You know, we, we, we don't want to repeat this exercise. It's a one-off. How can we make it work for the kids? That's what we're trying to do. So in terms of those dates, um, and this includes obviously uh, the major one in terms of the men's basketball final four, um, how flexible is the NCAA with its television partners, notably obviously CBS and Turner, to maybe, if need be, move things around in terms of dates and with all these sports actually creep into the summer before we, we get into the fall of 21 to make sure we can complete all of the 2021 championships that are, that are doable. Yeah, well, uh, uh, men's and women's basketball, you know, we've got to do what we need to do to support those athletes and those timelines. Uh, we're talking, of course, with our media partners co pretty constantly now about what flexibility they would have and we would have. Uh, we, we'd love nothing more than to hold the current dates constant, and that may well be doable. Uh, the virus is going to be an important part of this conversation because we got to do it in a safe fashion. But we're, we're hopeful that we can do that. But we are looking at alternatives, moving backward if we needed to. Where can we plug that in? Same thing with, uh, with later in the spring. You know, we're, we're playing, as you know, college baseball regularly in June. Well into June, we play softball late in the year, often when school's over. So, so we, can, we can look at those, those dates and move them back. When it comes to working with media partners, it, it also means that we may, may have things on TV and uh, days that we wouldn't, of the week that we wouldn't normally be playing them on. But that's, that's not inherently bad. We can, we can work our way through that. This is mostly logistics uh, and, and healthcare and media time. Uh, these are not insurmountable problems. They're hard, but they're not insurmountable. You know, one last thing, and you mentioned it, and obviously we're seeing it work. Uh, with the NBA, the, N the WNBA, MLS, uh, you know, with this bubble concept. Um, they're professionals, and so we know that. And as we've said, the NCAA controls the postseason and everything but FBS. If, big if, but if we are in a position where we still need to think about a bubble concept by the time we get to late March into the spring, uh, where you could have the students virtual because a lot of schools still could be, who knows, but create a bubble championship where everyone goes to one site, you're tested and all that, and you stay there and then people leave as they lose. What's the possibility of that for championships as we get later into the academic year, but earlier, if you will, into 2021? Yeah, I think it's I think it's perfectly viable in in many sports. It's it's harder in FCS football, for example. Um, but but if you had smaller brackets, so starting with 64 teams is tough. 32 is okay. That's maybe a manageable number. 16 certainly manageable. But you you got to figure out uh, again those logistics. Uh, there's there's doubtlessly ways to make that work. Uh, Joni Comstock, our senior VP for championships, and Danny Gavitt, who oversees basketball, um, uh, you know, they're working on all that really, really hard right now with, with all of the conferences and, and the oversight committees and the champs committees to, to see what that would look like. 
how you can manage the economics of it. It's, it's obviously expensive to do that. Uh, but we're not going to hold a championship in a way that puts student athletes at risk. If we, if we need to do a, a bubble model and that's the only way we can do it, then we'll figure that out. And, and the last thing I want to end, I mean, hopefully on a hopeful tone, uh, Mark, is that, you know, obviously it's going to be hard times at universities across the country at all levels, not just in the athletic department, certainly without having sports. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen economically, uh, but the hope is that things will get better. We will have championships. Uh, the television re revenue will still flow. What's your message to not just the student athletes, but the administrators, the staffs, those at these member institutions in the athletic departments that obviously are facing a lot of uncertainty uh, toward the end here as we go into the fall of 2020 with hope that 2021 will be better? Yeah, well, you kind of started on, on what is the NCA at the, at the top of the show here. And, and I think that's a, a really important point point to remember, the decisions of the association are the decisions of university presidents coming together and, and deciding this. We, we engage in an enormous amount of conversation. I think if the NCA and the conferences and the schools themselves sometimes could be, could be criticized, one of those criticisms is that, that we, we got to listen to our students better. We're hearing from football and basketball players in particular that they don't think their voice is being heard in all of this. We got to get better at that and incorporating those voices into all of our decisions. Um, and then we, we got some real positive things here. We can make this fall work for all kinds of reasons. We may not be having competitions, but that doesn't mean it's a lost semester. You know, it can be really, really good for our students. Uh, and then we can figure out how we do competitions and how we do championships uh, in the winter and spring. This, this is all possible, hard, but possible. Dr. Mark Emmert, NCAA president, as always, appreciate your time here on our NCAA Social Series episode 21. You can go to ncaa.org slash social series. We've got all of them archived, and we've been talking to the coronavirus medical advisory panel throughout the course of this pandemic. You can find all that information that's now out in sort of the general mainstream media. We've been discussing it right here on this show. As always, we appreciate your engagement, your time. Stay safe, everyone. We'll talk to you next week.